Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi everybody, my name is Steve, I'm an alcoholic. It's good to be here and it's good to be sober. Um, this is my home group, and my sobriety date is April 22nd, 2005. Um, I'll try and keep this short, although that's never been one of my strong points. Uh, sponsorship. Um, basics, my first sponsor, he took me through the steps as they were outlined in the big book, and uh, it brought about that, that change in my perception that I needed to stay sober. Um, and he really... Uh, you know, both, you know, my first sponsor and my sponsor currently, both of them, um, you know, my experience with the second step is that I look at them and I see uh, the program working in their lives and I see that they're happy and I see that they're joyous and they're free and it, it you know, it encourages me to take action to, to get that same result. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing is that I know that I need to continue to stay active in sponsoring others and continue to get this, you know, to give this thing away. I need to have somebody ahead of me who's setting an example for me, and I also need to set an example for somebody else because they're all watching me, <laughs> you know, which is, you know, good on some days and bad on others. But um, it's it's really, uh, as long as I stay in the middle of my sponsor, you know, who's further down the path than me, and I got guys who are following me, I'm pretty uh, safe. So I'm, I'm going to keep my promise and keep it short, and I'll introduce our speaker tonight, Heidi. <laughs> everybody. My name is Heidi and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Hi, that was a great talk, Steve, and thank you so much for asking me to speak and uh, mm-hmm. thanks for everybody being so welcoming and, and Megan, I love you and um, I'm really just grateful, so so grateful for AA and just, I get, you know, I don't know, I'm such a, <laughs> some people laugh at me sometimes because um, we read through those 12 traditions and I just choke up every time we get to the 12th tradition about you know, how practicing a genuine humility and, you know, to live in thankful contemplation of God who presides over us all. And um, that just touches me so much. Um, it really does. Um, so my um, my home group is the Atlanta group. I'm, um, I live in New York City, and you're all welcome. You're all invited to come. Our big excite, excited speaker meeting is on Tuesday nights. It's a three-speaker meeting. And we also have one Saturday night, and um, you're all welcome. Please come. Um, if you ever want to come, just get my number from Megan or Jim or Steve, and uh, we'll save you a seat. Um, we're a fun, you know, enthusiastic bunch, um, much like you, I'm sure. And I know that you guys have Clancy coming out here. He's going to do a gig here, and then he's going to do a gig on, at our at our joint on Tuesday night. So, <laughs> so that's cool. He's making the rounds. Um, I'm sober since um, September 3rd, 1990, and um, I have a sponsor, and um, I got sober three days after my 16th birthday, and that's just my story. It's the only story I have, and uh, if anybody's sitting here thinking, oh, God, I'm not going to identify with her because she came in young, maybe her drinking looks different than me, I just want to encourage you to um, try to identify with the feelings, and, um, you know, speaking of sponsorship, um, I always love to share about my first sponsor, Annette. And, um, you know, anyone who's heard me speak multiple times is like, all right, enough with the Annette stories. But, um, or maybe not, you know, but she's, she, really, she really saved my life. Um, she was, um, she was a, a person, an alcoholic, who didn't get sober until she was 63. And um, she, you know, like her excuse could have been, you know, well, what's the point? I'm so old now. I might as well just drink myself to death, you know. And I was 16, and I could have said, well, why would I get sober now? I'm too young. You know, this doesn't make any sense. And the thing is, is that we were exactly the same. <laughs> we were exactly the same on the inside. And um, what happened for me is, um, I'll backtrack and, you know, kind of tell you a little bit about my, my story and where I came from and what my life is like today and what it's, what it's been like. I mean, there's been a lot of life, you know. Um, I've been, you know, sober for you know, all my adult life at this point, you know, and I've probably made more mistakes in my sobriety, you know, at this point because there's been more, more time to make mistakes and, uh, 
you know, just see my alcoholism look different, and um, and that's okay. Like, that's why I have a 10-step and why I can continue working this program and why I need to stay active in AA. Um, it's really, really important to me, and, um, you know, it's like what I did yesterday is not, I can't stay sober on what I did yesterday. It might work for a little while. It's good insurance. You know, um, Dr. Bob in his story talks about taking out insurance against a possible slip. Um, and that's good sometimes for a while, like if I've got to go on a business trip and I've got to go stretch without meetings or whatever. But ultimately, I have to look for ways, each, for me, you know, each day that I can renew this program and keep it fresh. And, um, you know, this morning I was in a big book study and we were talking about, we actually read, um, it's the, we do a Joe and Charlie big book study. It's called Bagels and Big Book. And it's a, a big, like a big book workshop, the first and third Sunday of every month. And um, it's, it's so cool. My current sponsor actually started it because she attended a, a big book, um, a, you know, the Joe and Charlie weekend. And, and she and this other guy, Vince, from my home group, wanted to, um, it was just, you know, I mean, the story, the way I kind of heard it is they were kind of worn out from like, you know, meeting with people individually and trying to tell them, you know, give them the message of Joe and Charlie. So they thought, you know what, let's bring a bunch of people together and, and share this with everybody. And then that way, you know, we'll create more big book sponsors. And um, so anyway, this, this Joe and Charlie big book study, Bagels and Big Book, started in my sponsor's living room. And then um, this was like years ago. And now it's, you know, it's in the meeting schedule. Um, but anyway, we were there this morning, and it's a huge meeting. It's crazy, you know, to people there on a Sunday morning to listen to these, you know, two old guys who are just so much, so fun, you know. And um, and uh, anyway, we were reading how it works, and um, and I was thinking about another man who was really instrumental in in my sobriety when I first got sober, Armand. And at the time, and I just share this because. You know, I, I practiced something that I learned from Armand as a newcomer tonight. And what that was, was, um, you know, I'd always watch Armand, and he was, he was one of the founders of my first home group. And Armand, every time, we always read How It Works in the beginning of the meeting. And I would always see Armand. Armand's actually sponsored by Clancy, too. Um, and I would always see Armand. He'd put his glasses on. He would follow along with his finger, you know, like as if it was the first time he was ever reading How It Works. And to me, this was like the oldest of the old timers. You know, and it was just, he really showed me this example of the humility with which he approached the literature after all that time. And, um, and I, I still do that, you know, even though sometimes I'd rather, you know, check my phone or I'd rather think about something else. Um, it's just a good exercise for me to, you know, to, to look at the book again and, and to sort of look at, like, you know, what does this mean to me today, right now? You know, because I need, I need like, a, a program that's going to work for me right now. So, anyway, a little bit about where I'm from. I'm, um, I got sober on the West Coast. I'm from the from uh, Seattle area, um, the Northwest. It's dark and, and rainy. And, um, you know, i got to tell you, I didn't ever notice how sort of gray and, um, you know, all the time it is until I moved to New York and there were seasons. <laughs> but I think part of it was just I lived in my own world. I mean, I really did. <laughs> like, just kind of lived in my own kind of world. I mean, I really I really did. Like, I just had my own stuff going on all the time from the time I can remember. It was all about me, um, all about my fear. Um, you know, I grew up in an alcoholic home, um, you know, just... Um, you know, and that was really important when I first got sober. I had to tell everybody about how my parents were alcoholics, and it was so hard, it was so rough, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, really, and actually probably for many years in AA, it was a big, it was like my back pocket. You know, it was it was that, you know how, you, like, I don't know if anybody here can relate to this, but it was the one thing I could pull out, you know, that like, you know, that was like an excuse, you know, for for all my dysfunction, for all the reasons why I couldn't have a relationship, for the reasons why I was in debt, for the reasons why I didn't have tools, you know, like I didn't get, you know, and the reason why I wanted to move apartments all the time, and the reason why, you know, I didn't know how to be direct with men, you know, if they would ask me out, the reason, you know, just that was that was the reason. It's because I've got an alcoholic mother and then I have, a, you know, an alcoholic father who's very seductive and they're both narcissists and blah, 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 and psychobabble and da-da-da, you know, and... um. And, you know, the truth is, is that um, my sister, you know, the, the truth is, is that, like, whatever, I'm sure that I could, I could get a professional to, to validate all of, all of that, you know, I'm sure that I could, and, and I have done, I have actually done a lot of outside work, and it's been really beneficial, it's been a, a great 
um, you know, it's, it's really helped my AA program to support me when I have dealt with outside issues. Um, and I have, you know, and that's something, you know, if anybody um, just has alcoholism, that's awesome. Um, that hasn't been the case with me. Um, I'll just share with you. I'm kind of going all over the place, and I hope that's okay. But, you know, I went to treatment at two and a half years sober with major depression and an eating disorder. And, you know, I was working the steps. You know, I was working the steps. I was active in a home group. I was GSR of my home group. And the truth is, is that I needed help. You know, I needed, I needed some outside help. And, uh, you know, and I had to deal with deal with some other things in sobriety. Does that make me a bad AA? No. You know, it just means that this other stuff came up and thank God, you know, I had I had this home group of like, you know, all these old drunks being like, what? you know, we don't understand this outside issue. Like, you know, my, my first sponsor, Annette, had to like watch Oprah to like understand, you know, what, what this like crazy girl was going through. You know, she had to like you know, they didn't get it, but they sent me lots of cards in, in treatment, you know. And, you know, and they did, you know. And, and they, they, you know, they, they, um, you know, they told me that, that um, no matter what, you know, I could get through it sober without picking up a drink. You know, and every, every challenge that I've had in AA has, has been like that. You know, the AA has just, has been there for me. And, and I try to be there for AA, you know, too. But, um. Anyway, back to the way I grew up. I mean, I always grew up feeling different. We moved a lot. You know, we, we moved like, every, you know, I think I went chain schools nine times by the time that I was in eighth grade. And what that did for me, you know, the tool I developed was being a really good chameleon, you know. I, um, you know, it's really good at sort of making friends. Um, I also have that very overly dependent personality type. I want you to like me. You know, I um, always, you know, was sort of like teacher's, I wouldn't say like Eddie Haskell, teacher's pet, but I was also always like, really, you know, had to have the teacher like me. I was always a perfectionist kid. Um, my primary emotion that I remember growing up was feeling worried, um, feeling like I was on the outside looking in. There's a picture of me when I'm about four years old that really accurately sort of gives me a, a picture. It, it really, it shows how I felt. And it's a, what's, what it is, is in the foreground is my little sister, and she's like, you know, has a dress on with no underwear, and she's just adorable, and she has a big floppy hat on, and she's holding on to my uncle's leg, and she's so cute, and I'm, like, in the background, like, lurking, you know? I mean, I'm, like, this <laughs> cute, cute little blonde-haired girl, and, like, I'm just, I'm sort of, like, and I, you know, I don't know if I remember that, that moment because I've seen the picture so much, or if I really remember that moment, but what the feeling was, how do I get in there? How do I, how do I like hang around with that much, you know, effortlessness and how do I just, you know, how do I have fun and be cute too, you know, and I was always, you know, by the time I was seven, um, you know, I was always trying to be older than I was. I was, you know, dressing up in feather boas and makeup and, you know, that was just normal around my house. Like that's what I did to, to play, you know, was just, you know, put lipstick and eyeshadow on and, um, you know, I guess moving moving around a lot and, and uh, my parents getting divorced and have a single mom and, you know, there were like, you know, I just, I saw a lot of things and I was around a lot um, and uh, around a lot of things and, and um, you know, I think that what started to happen is, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm really, uh, so my mom, um, I'm just going to share this. My mom just started a prison sentence last week. And um and uh she's been she's been in and around in and out of AA for since 1985 and um you know what's interesting is that my little sister came out of the same family, right? And she didn't find it necessary to hit, you know, she doesn't have the allergy of the body and the obsession of the mind of alcoholism like I do. You know, she came out of the same family and she, you know, she was able to, you know, maintain a functional life, you know, and, um, and that wasn't the story with me. Um, what happened for me is um, around the time I was 10, I did my first geographic. Um, and, you know, this is another sign to me, like, you know, I, there's all these little things that I know that I'm, I'm an alcoholic and that I would be an alcoholic even if I came out of like the Cleaver family, right? <laughs> so, you know, I know because, you know, I can't argue. I mean, the, the one thing I can't argue with is I cannot argue with the allergy of the body. I cannot argue with the fact that the times when I meant to only have one or two drinks, I would find myself obliterated. Times when I said I'm not going to drink, 
I would end up drunk, and I didn't know how it happened. And then, you know, the other thing I can't argue with, and that I've never been able to, you know, talk myself out of is that mental obsession, right? And, you know, the thing is, like, when I wasn't drinking, because I very quickly, after I started drinking, started controlling my drinking, right? I was like, I'm not drinking. You know that part, in, there's a story in the, in the big book that talks about, like, Jim, the alcoholic car salesman, and he, you know, and he's like, you know, I drove out into the country, still no thought of drinking, you know, blah, 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 wasn't even thinking about drinking, you know, and it's like, that's how I was, I was like, I am not even thinking about drinking at all, like, it's not even coming into my mind, and if I'm, <laughs> you know, it's like, I was, I was thinking about drinking, because I was thinking about not drinking, and that's the same thing as thinking about drinking, but anyway, <laughs> Right, that's like faulty alcoholic logic right there. But um, so, you know, basically what happened is around the time I was 10, um, it was the summer before I went into sixth grade, things were getting pretty bad at home. Um, and my solution was, um, you know, one sunny summer day was, you know, my, my little sister, who's now actually active in Al-Anon, thank God, she, um, you know, she stayed. And my solution was, you know what, I got to get out of here. Things are getting bad. So at 10, I decided it would be a good idea to move a couple states away and move in with my aunt in Palm Springs. It seemed, you know, kind of glamorous. You know, again, I was, like, way older than my years. I was like, you know, I'll go move in with Aunt Becky. And she was a single mom, too. And we, you know, and I was like, you know, I'll go down there. I'll be a nanny. I was going to teach my, um, teach my, uh, my my cousin manners that was the idea there but really what it was is like my aunt wasn't home a lot and so it was like me and my little cousin but you know my point is is that I had that ism you know the reason why I'm telling you what happened before I took I picked up a drink is that I had that ism even before I picked up a drink you know and another thing the great thing that my sponsor says is she says I have alcoholism not alcoholism you know, and it, and it's true. You know, I had all that stuff going on, and so then when I poured alcohol on top of it, it was like a disaster. So I pulled this geographic. You know, I moved in with my aunt, and around Christmas, I got a call from uh, my other aunt saying that my mom had been admitted to rehab. And anyone who's ever been to a rehab, um, what they do is they educate the family. It was this very dramatic thing. I flew home to Washington, and I think I saw my mom get a chip and. The counselors educated, um, you know, me and my sister, and I think, you know, that we got all this, like, these handouts, these Alateen handouts, and, you know, and the, they gave us these, like, treatment center, you know, pie charts that showed, you know, the percentages of alcoholic daughters who become alcoholics, and, you know, I learned the word heredity and propensity for the illness, you know, and the disease, and, you know, I learned all these things, and, you know, and I think I even sort of started dropping into, like, ACOA meetings, and I remember, like, you know, I was, like, 12, and, like, you know, stand, I would stand, you know, stand in a circle and sort of, you know, cry, and it was very emotional, and, you know, I mean, I thought I was getting in touch with all these things, and I, you know, I really wasn't. I was, like, getting in touch with my ego is really what it was, you know, because what happened is, you know, I had all this self-knowledge, right? I was like, oh, yeah, you know, better be careful around drinking, better, you know, better be careful, and I got to tell you, like, it totally, like, I heard it, but it just didn't, I didn't, looking back now, it's like it didn't apply to me, you know, it didn't, it was like, uh uh-huh, thanks for the information, and, you know, within six months, I had the idea one day after, after sixth grade, you know, after school, that it would be a good idea to steal alcohol from my father, and I remember the first time, you know, and one, I remember that first time, and I drank the way that I, I typically drank during my drinking, which was with one little girlfriend who couldn't have cared less if we drank, you know, and I was like, let's drink, like, that was the activity, and um, we took the alcohol, we went down to the beach, and I remember throwing my head back, and, you know, the wind was blowing, and, you know, it was this very dramatic, I was also, you know, a big part of my story, and probably still today is, like, the dramatics, and the scene, and, the, you know, the wind blowing, and we were on the rocks, and the bluff, and, you know, and I remember that warm feeling, you know, that warm feeling and that sense of ease and comfort that I got from, from taking that alcohol, you know. And um, I had taken sips of my dad's, um, my dad's alcohol before, but it was the first time that I felt like I could do something by myself and I could, I could get something. You know, it was like that I can finally get something and do something for myself. You know, now, if I didn't have the allergy of the body, that might, it might not be a, a problem, but the problem is, is that 
I had that feeling, and then I wanted more, you know, and then that, that feeling then became paramount. That desire for that feeling became, became more important than, than anything else that I, I had going for me, you know. I, was, I had been, like, you know, pretty much like a straight-A student, you know. I had, I had good friends, you know, good friends, and, you know, within a year after I started drinking at 11, I dropped out of all my honors classes, um, changed friends, you know, I still had a couple of those like nice, good friends, and it's funny actually, there's a, um, a social networking website that I recently finally joined, I'm sure you all know which one I'm talking about, but all these, these girls that I went to middle school with um, have been reconnecting with me, and lately there's been this conversation about all these memories from junior high, and i got to tell you, I do not remember any of them, I don't remember, I, I really don't remember, and um, you know, just pretty much what happened for me is, I, you know, I started drinking, and, um, you know, there's not any, like, glamorous social drinking. I thought it was glamorous. I had my own, you know, I lived on a cul-de-sac in this, like, little town called Bainbridge Island, and I had my own little universe going on in my room. It was like, we were like this nice sort of, like, you know, picturesque house on this beautiful cul-de-sac on Bainbridge Island, and then there was my room, which was like, you know, one little alcove painted dark green, and like weird, you know, scar, you know, weird tapestries hanging from the ceiling, and like Pink Floyd, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, like these were all my heroes, you know, and, um, you know, plus like Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton, I don't know if anyone knows those writers, but like those were, you know, those were my heroes, and both those, you know, both those, you know, those po- female poets died by sticking their heads in the oven, you know, and that you know, that's that's what I aspired to, you know, and I, I really I did like I identified with that darkness, you know, that's what made me feel alive. And um so basically what happened is um, you know, during the course of this I just you know, I started out by just you know I started out by just like stealing my dad's whiskey and um, you know, just you know, just drinking, drinking, drinking. I mean, pretty much the way it went is I would have my, my one little girlfriend. I would be like, let's get drunk. And um, I would take us into the kitchen. I would line up the shots and, you know, and we would drink. And then we'd go sit down and, you know, and we'd go back to watching the movie, that would, whatever, whatever we were doing. And, um, and, and I always remember, I was like, I'm not feeling it yet. We, you know, it was like I couldn't get the alcohol in fast enough. And, um, you know, quickly what started to happen is, you know, um, you know, it was like hard alcohol was the problem because it made me throw up. And so then it was like, well, just drink beer, you know. Um, but then somebody would have some hard alcohol, and so I'd drink that. Um, you know, I was barely showing up at school, um, fighting with my dad. You know, I was a kid um, in class that the teachers would, like, you know, shake their head about. You know, my dad was a teacher at my high school, um, and, you know, oftentimes he walked through the attendance office, and the, the secretary would be like, where was, you know, Heidi wasn't there for his period, what's going on? And he'd be like, oh, she was sick. And then later on, he'd be like, why weren't you at first, in, you know, where were you? And I'd be like, oh, you know, 24-hour flu. That was always my excuse, 24-hour flu. Or I was, you know, I was having my monthly, you know, thing. That's a really good excuse. That's a really good thing to throw in for a dad. Um, I also, you know, during this time, I was stealing money out of my dad's wallet. Um, he, you know, my father, um, my father is, is a heavy drinker, and he, kind of goes to bed around 8 or 8.30, which was perfect for me because I, I had people going in and out of my room all the time, and um, he would leave his wallet on the counter, and I would I would just take money out of his wallet. And, um, you know, and at that time, I remember just, you know, feeling like, you know, he didn't pay child support for all those years, so I would just garnish his wages myself. You know, <laughs> you know? and, like, this is... So, like, my point is, is, like, what does this have to do with drinking? Like, what does that have to do with drinking? I mean, you know... It has it has something to do with alcoholism, right? Because I had that resentful, entitled thinking. Like he owes me, the world owes me, you know. And that is a line of thinking that I really had to work on in sobriety, you know. Like, you know, having to go to work. Like, don't you know how hard I work? You know, I'm a good AA. I stay sober. I help people. And now you want me to work? You know, I mean, you want me to? I owe all this money for tax. I mean, I really, I've had to work with these. These old ideas, I mean, I'm glad people are laughing that I'm not the only one who has this kind of like bananas kind of like thinking, you know. Um, 
the other day I was talking to my sponsor and I, I gave her a list of all the stressors I've had in my life and I was expecting her to say, wow, that's really, you know, God, that's mind-blowing. You've been through so much in the last couple of weeks. She said, yeah, well, welcome to adult life, you know. She just wasn't even giving me an inch. But, um, so, you know, during this time I'll give you another, just one more example of an abnormal reaction to alcohol. But um, I went to Russia when I was uh, 14 between uh, freshman and sophomore year. Um, I was 14 years old. And I was involved in a theater company, and um, you know, and uh, and it was this, it was actually a really cool experience, and I wish I could have actually experienced all of it. But um, what I remember a lot, mostly from that Russian trip, was um, was the cognac-filled chocolates, the stoli that I bought um, from the little tourist shops with the credit card my my dad and my stepmother had given me, and the older guy that I was obsessed with, right? Um, And of course, you know, that's another part of my story is this stick obsessive relationship. He was older than me. You know, I was like, you know, he, you know, I thought we were going to finally like, you know, sort of take care of our unrequited love in Russia. And, you know, it was going to be this romantic thing. And, you know, I just, that whole fantasy life, you know, I just had that fantasy of of what it was going to be like. And I was so dramatic and you know, and um, again, you know, I thought we were like, you know, 25 and living in New York City and really like we were, you know, two kids from Bainbridge Island and we were doing a musical in Russia. But um, anyway, so um, we, uh, you know, we were in Russia and, um, you know, one particular night, um, he, I thought we were going to get together that night and um, and I saw him, you know, beautiful Siberian, you know, the, the sun is setting, we're in our hotel cor- courtyard. We, it was a collaboration with this Russian children's theater company. And, um, you know, we're sort of playing, ga- you know, Russian games in the courtyard. It, it should be this, like, sort of idyllic, you know, sort of picture of youth. And, uh, and, uh, and I remember seeing him sort of go and basically ask out the Russian ballerina, you know, who was, of course, the most beautiful, like, everything that I wasn't. You know, she was sort of, like, statuesque and, you know, she was short, like I always wanted to be whatever I wasn't, you know, and she was, she didn't speak English, so that was even more, and plus she played the firebird in the play, so she got to wear this like spandex red, like beautiful thing, and I played Heinous the Troll, you know, that was my role, yeah, and um, you know, I had like blacked out teeth and a skull cap with like, you know, and um, and I remember just standing back, you know, and, and seeing this happen in the sunset, and seeing them sort of like go together, and you know, a, a normal 14-year-old girl might see that happen and they might you know they might feel upset and talk to their girlfriends maybe write in their journal and you know talk about you know whatever and I just remember like turning on my heel and going you know calmly back into into the hotel and I got the key from the little hotel maid to his room because of course I bought a bottle of vodka and put it in his room right and um, and I just proceeded to drink the bottle of vodka. And um, you know, by two in the morning that night, I was on the phone with my mother from Siberia, you know, crying and going, "Say the serenity prayer with me, mom. Say the serenity prayer with me." Right? Because side note, by this time, my mom was dropping in every now and then and taking me to AA meetings. You know, and um, it's that whole like head full of AA, belly full of booze thing. Um, and and you know, I'd always I'd go to the meeting with her, and I was total like interest observer. You know, I was like, oh, you know, you know, they'd ask me like, you know, do you want to share, little girl, or whatever? And I and I'd say, you know, I'd say, oh, I'm Heidi, and I don't know what I am, but I just think it's so great what you're doing for my mother. And um, you know, and uh, yeah, and um. And I, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting, too. And I remember, you know, that whole, like, I'm not drinking thing. Um, the last New Year's before I got sober, I I started to get an inkling that, that alcohol was maybe a problem for me. And I started to write in my journal, like, okay, I'm not going to drink for two weeks. And then the next entry would be, I'm drunk again, you know. I would, you know, list of goals, you know, get an A in French, make my bed every day, cut down on drinking, and that, that just doesn't, that doesn't work, you know, and I was also really afraid of misery and depression, and, um, you know, what happened was, I just want to speed up because it's about 10 after 9, right? I just spied someone's watch, just want to keep an eye on, it. okay. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, basically just the progression, and, um, and I was miserable when I was sober, and um, I was miserable when I was drinking, um, it just, it wasn't, fun. I mean, there were some fun times. I mean, that's, that's the thing, like, I don't know if any of you have had this experience, like, it's, 
sometimes my disease can say like, oh, there were those fun times, and there were those times when I could control it, and there were those times when I didn't drink every day. Yeah, okay, there were, but what happened when I drank? And, you know, the fact that once I started drinking, I couldn't, I couldn't control it, and the fact that there was so much um, energy pumped into not drinking, you know, another expression that I've heard is that anything you have to control is out of control. Um, and, uh, you know, I really have been reflecting lately, um, just like, I mean, I, I do a lot, I think, but every now and then lately, especially, I've just been thinking about what a miracle it is that I'm sober and I don't really understand why, I don't understand why, um, I really don't because, um, I didn't intend, um, when I, you know, I didn't, it's not like I, one day was like, all oh, right, this is going to be the last time I'm drinking. I'm going to join AA and do it their way. You know, I had no idea what I was in for. Um, really what happened is I was a kid who was totally lost. I was, you know, thinking about killing myself. I was wishing that I hadn't had enough guts to cut myself because I, you know, to, to hurt myself in some way. Um, but I'm such a coward that, <laughs> that um, I couldn't do that. And I just, you know, I was obsessed with the older guy and, um, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't seem to make any kind of effective change in my life. And um, so another geographic, my mom um, got a job um, in a town a couple hours away as a drug and alcohol counselor at this high school. And, um, and I thought, okay, you know what, I will become a good girl again. You know, it was like I was going to return, you know, return to goodness. You know, I thought that it would really be that easy. And I, um, I thought it just, you know, I was going to quit drinking and, and move in with my mom and, like, move away. And I have to say, like, you know, today I know, like, again, it was another geographic. However, I do have to say that where I was at in my life as a 16-year-old girl, it actually was a very effective, like, that was an effective tool. Moving me away from, my, from the people I was partying with was actually a really effective tool. So I really don't regret, you know, I don't poo-poo the fact that I used that. Um, I didn't know I was, I was using that to, to get sober at the time. It just happened that way. And, you know, maybe I would have gotten sober if I would have stayed there, but I don't know. You know, I really, it's like I had to just, like, leave. Um, and so what happened is I, I um, you know, I planned my last drunk. Um, and, again, it was with one little hostage girlfriend. And, um, you know, and I remember I had, like, this moment of clarity that last night. And I remember we were sitting in these two two chairs and we were doing my favorite thing we were watching a David Lynch film and um, you know a weird some kind of weird psychotic you know disturbing film and you know that I loved you know and um and I had you know and you know I had like the glasses chilling whatever and I remember all the lights were off and there the blue light was on our faces and um I had this moment like this like bird's eye view above us and I remember she was talking to me. It was like our last night together before I was moving. She was talking, 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 and she had her glass. And I had the bottle, and I had my glass. And I, it was like I saw from above what it, looked, what it was, what the situation was. And the truth was is that she was in the room with me, talking to me, and I was there with the bottle. And I could have been with anyone. I could have been alone. I could have been with anyone. But it was like I was with the bottle, and she happened to be there. And um, anyway... Big moment of clarity, and um, I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but I just remember having that sensation. So the next day, I, I moved, and um, I was a wreck. Um, you know, uh, the, the first nine months, I was dry. I was just kind of a spectator in AA. I, um, you know, I sort of, like, came to meetings late. You know, I just, it was like a buffet to me. I just sort of took what I want, left the rest. I mean, truth be known, it, it's not like anyone was telling me, kid, you need to do X, Y, and Z. It was like, I just... I just didn't know that that was, you know, that there were other things to do. I thought you just kind of, like, went to the meetings and, you know, and I also, like, I identified myself as an addict for a long time because it was more general, you know, and I could also identify with it, you know, sort of like Jim Morrison and Janis Joplin were addicts, so it was, like, sort of, it was more of a personality trait, like me saying, hi, I'm Heidi, and I'm dramatic, you know, it was, you know, it just sort of, it was less specific, you know, it just was like, you know, and, and it was kind of cool, you know, and, um, and I learned the lingo, and, you know, I don't really know, like, the, the steps and the traditions. Nobody kind of talked to me about that. I think I had a big book, and, you know, and, um, 
And, you know, within nine months, I was, those first nine months, I was, I was really dry. And I remember just, you know, so many nights being like crying and being like, I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, I, I would, I would actually, I would hit myself, you know, that's sort of self-harm is a big part of my story. And I've done that, you know, I've done that in sobriety too, actually like punched myself and, you know, and, um, I reached this point at about nine months sober where, um, you know, my mom, um, we went to this big book meeting and um, it was, I think it was probably the first time that I'd ever, you know, like heard the big book, you know, like heard it, you know, and, um, and I came home and I just remember crying and crying and crying. She said, what's wrong? And, and what I realized now is that I was at this crossroads, you know, it was like I was either going to drink, you know, or I was going to kill myself. And I didn't know that there was another way. And, um, you know, and, and she said, what do you want? And I remember just imagining the deli up the street, you know, and imagining all the liquor there in the, in the refrigerator or just killing myself. I didn't know, you know, I just didn't know. And so we, you know, I, I don't know how I got through that night, but the next week I went back to the meeting. I took the burning desire. I gurgled out some cry for help. And the man who was chairing the meeting, I always share this story. It was Armand, the guy who follows along with how it works. Um, <clears throat> he, was, you know, he looked at me and he said, he didn't say thanks for sharing, you know, or keep coming back, kid. He looked right at me. The whole meeting was, you know, was like, oh. and, um, and he said, do you have a sponsor? And I said, no. And he said, get a sponsor. And it was the first time someone had, like, looked at me and given me direction. And, and that was the biggest gift he gave to me. He didn't sort of, like, beat around the bush. You know, like, oh, what's wrong with her? Like, oh, you know, I wonder what that could be. It's like, oh, you know, like, hello, it's alcoholism, you know, I'm treated alcoholism. And um, and so then the next week, I, I, you know, was, I'm so grateful I got Annette as my sponsor. And Annette, you know, she was the oldest member of the group. I was the youngest member of the group. There was nobody my age where I got sober. It really didn't matter. Um, those old timers in the group, they explained everything to me. You know, they, they had me join. You know, they taught me how to join AA. They gave me a job. Um, you know, Annette took me through the book. She told me to highlight anything that I identified with, that I had questions about, that I agreed with, disagreed with. And um, what that did for me, I was just thinking about this this morning, is it, it made the big book come alive for me, you know. And so, like, I was able to find myself in this book when you think that, you know, I don't really have a lot in common with Bill, Bill Wilson, you know, one of the founders of our fellowship. But the truth is, is that when I went through his story, I had so much in common with him, you know, his, the tremendous ego that I had in me at age 11, you know, I totally identified with that, that like I, in the midst of all the excitement, I discovered liquor, you know, that's a line that I really keyed in on. Um, when I read the doctor's opinion, it was like, it was the first time that it was ever explained to me that it wasn't a moral issue. I wasn't a bad girl. You know, I wasn't a bad person. And that was actually a feeling that I'd had all my life. My mom told me actually that around the time I was like 10, that movie, The Bad Seed came out. And I, I told her that I thought I was the bad seed. You know, I just always felt like there was something very bad about me. And that's actually, you know, that's actually something that I've had to really work with in sobriety, getting rid of that old idea. And um, just a segue into, you know, like living in sobriety, um, you know, how it works talks about like getting rid of all, all of our old ideas and how the result is nil until we let go absolutely. And that's something that I really try to work with in my inventory today. Um, like if I have a resentment, if I have a fear, um, what's the old idea that's kind of wrapping me around a pole? Um, I'll come back to that in just a second. But, you know, the way Annette was very, um, you know, she taught me to be of service in my home group and do service outside the home group. Um, she taught me really simple things like always to give up my chair if there was somebody who was like had come late to the meeting and needed a chair. You know, she taught me to sit at the table, sit up front, to pour coffee for people, you know, and... Um, you know, she explained the first three steps to me very simply. Is step one, do you think you're an alcoholic or not? Step two, do you think AA can work for you? Step three, are you going to do AA or not? You know, and that was that was as simple as I kept it, and it's still as simple as I keep it some, time, some days, you know. Um, a higher power, um, you know, it's interesting. I had a girl recently ask me, like, what's your higher power? And I was really like, you know, I really don't know. <laughs> um, you know, a higher power, I just take the action, and then what's happened over time is that, you know, I've come to believe in, in something greater than me, and for a long time it was just, like, something that was better than me, something that wasn't as thick and crazy as me, and that was my sponsor, AA, 
you know, the people that I would call and ask for help, um, the 12 steps, because what started to happen is that as I started to take action, you know, I started to get better. Um, you know, those early years were amazing. You know, I graduated high school in sobriety. You know, I used to get in my little car and, on my high school lunch and drive down to the Nooner and, like, hang out with Edaholic and, you know, Crazy Ronnie and, like, you know, all the, all the, you know, the old guys. But it was, it was exactly what I needed to do. Um, you know, and then I went, I, I went away to college and I was able to, you know, the first, the, every time I've moved a lot in sobriety and every time that I've moved, I've, um, you know, always gotten a home group, gotten a sponsor, gotten a service commitment. Um, I just kind of want to touch on, on the steps and how, um, you know, just how those have come into my life. Um, so, you know, step one, two, and three are something that I do every single day. Um, every morning I try to say, good morning, God. You know, I'm an alcoholic, and I need you to restore me to sanity. Um, and then, you know, and then every day I try to take the actions that um, that will restore me to sanity. You know, like trying to be helpful and, and trying to also let other people help me. Um, you know, the third step, um, how I do that is is by taking the actions. Um, the first four step that I did was um, was amazing to me. It was totally mind blowing. I mean, I was a person who had spent all my life blaming other people um, or blaming everything on myself. Um, you know, I've swung to both those extremes in sobriety. Also, another thing that I just, you know, that has been a big aha for me the last few years is probably for the first 10 years in AA, I read the big book as being very like, you know, it was as if someone was taking a whip and being like, selfishness, self-centeredness, that's the root of your troubles. You know, you're screwed up. You're horrible. You know, so it was like when I wrote that fourth step early on, I got to that sort of that fourth column where it's like, what's my part? I was like, you know, I'm self-righteous and I'm judgmental and I'm this. I'm almost getting this like, you know, I won't say a sick pleasure, but like almost like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I misinterpreted it. I misinterpreted what, what the book was saying to me. You know, it wasn't saying you're a horrible person and you're really sick. You know, it was like when I first got sober, I would hear people say, you know, old timers say, like, I'm a sick, self-centered son of a you-know-what. And so I thought that that's how I was supposed to talk about myself. I thought that that's what I was supposed to say to myself. And, you know, this for me, this has been a program about ego deflation. And I knew I do need to remember that I can be very sick. And I hope this doesn't contradict anything that anyone, you know, thinks or believes or does for practices for themselves. But what started to happen to me is that um, uh, self-hatred is a big defect of character of mine. And what started to happen is, like, I misinterpreted all that. And, um, and I, for a long time, told myself how, how sick I was. And any thought that I have is a bad thought. And, um, you know... And I, you know, I misinterpreted all that stuff about, you know, anger is the dubious luxury and I can't ever feel, you know, so I walked around, I think, for a decade being like, I'm, I'm never angry, you know, and if I'm angry, I'm a bad, I'm a bad person, you know. And so then, so what happened was, you know, I had like all this bottled up, like, rage that was turned inward, you know, and, um, and I, I got a little, I got sick, kind of in sobriety, and, um, you know, and, and Jim and I were talking before the meeting, that's, it's possible. And, you know, again, was it, is it because I was a bad AA and I wasn't doing something right? No, it just meant that, like, that was just part of my growth process. And, you know, when I first got sober, I used to hear old timers talking about the layers of the onion. I'd be like, layers of the onion? <laughs> kind of program you work in, Mac? You know, like, <laughs> you know, like, either you work, you know, you take the seventh step and you ask for those defects to remove, or, or you don't. You know, like, I was so, I had such, you know, spiritual, you know what I mean? Like, I had such spiritual pride. Like, I really thought, like, the first time that I took, that I took a seventh step, prayer, that I said that seven step prayer, which is where we ask God to remove those defects of character, I wrote the date down. So I was like, I want to remember, I want to remember the day that I became defect free. <laughs> right? And, um, you know, it's so funny because God, I, and I think I, I probably was defect free for, you know, for a little while and then, you know, kind of reality set in and, um, you know, I got involved in a relationship, you know, and, um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, and that was, and you know, and I started having access to credit cards and, you know, 
<laughs> you know, and um, and you know, so I've gotten to do a lot of work um, with my defects in a continuing level. Um, just to share about that, actually, um, you know, I um, how much time do I have? Like five minutes? Two minutes? Five minutes? Okay. Um, I was because it's an important part of of my story and like where I'm at today. Um, I was I got engaged to you know boy meets girl on AA campus. Um, I was um, in college. I met a boy at an AA meeting and um, and um, and I just will share about this. The one thing that my sponsor, my first sponsor, never said you know don't date for your first year. There was never any direction given to me. But what she said to me, she would never address that issue because you know she just wouldn't. But what she would say is, we need to learn to be friends with men and women. That's all she would say. And so that was sort of my, my credo, was I just need to learn to be friends with men and women. I kept it that kept it that simple. Annette kept it that simple for me. I mean, also, there was no one really my age, so no one was really interested in me unless they had, you know, other stuff going on. Um, <laughs> or unless, you know, whatever. It just wasn't, it wasn't appropriate. However, okay, so I met this, I met this guy, and, um, and I will say that, you know, he was new in town. He was very cute. And um, when, the night that I met him, he was new at the meeting. I said, nice to meet you, Jamie. This is Mike. He'll tell you about the men's meeting. And I just share that because that's what I was taught to do, you know, just to, like, be welcoming. But then, like, it wasn't for me to be his welcoming committee. So fast forward a couple months. I'm not saying that anything that anyone else does is bad, whatever. I'm just sharing what happened for me. So a couple months later, we started dating. We ended up engaged. And, um, you know, we were both in AA. It was great, you know, like, you know, active AA couple. You know, we'd be, you know, Lay, you know, in our apartment together, both on the phone with Santis, what could be more romantic, you know, <laughs> you know, going to meetings and, you know, both pray, you know, doing our 11 step together and taking 11 step retreats and blah, blah, blah. And, and um, around the time that um, I was about, I think like nine years sober, um, he, um, we really grew apart and um, I kind of lost touch with very basic like in you know sort of 10 10 11 and 12 you know I was doing service I was you know definitely active and had a sponsor but I didn't have the kind of sponsor I think that um you know she was she was wonderful but I think that you know it was like I'd call her with like my hair on fire and she'd be like well why don't you just you know take a bubble bath and order some Chinese food and I'd be like uh, okay, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, the truth is, is I, ne- I needed to, like, actually put pen to paper and draw columns, and I was starting to act out with him, and, you know, and just in ways, you know, I just wasn't, I had no ability to be in an intimate partnership with somebody, and um, he, um, one day, was acting weird, and I said, what's going on, and he said, you know, he first said, I'm not going to tell you, and then I said, you have to tell me now, and he said, I had a couple drinks um, the other night, and, um, you know, and it was like, my world was so rocked, you know, um, you know, granted, I wasn't really sure about if we were going to get married, but I just share about this, because what happened is um, he had also gotten sober young, and he started to say things like, you know, I think I was, you know, I've done a lot of work since then. And, you know, I think that I'm a different person than I was now. And, you know, and, and like I'm, I'm taught, at, we're taught in this program that, like, we don't diagnose anybody. And, you know, and so I didn't say, like, you know, are you crazy? You know, I just, I just said, okay, you know. And, and so then I started to kind of, you know, explore our sister fellowship, Al-Anon, to, like, get some tools to deal with that. But what happened was I, I actually, like, I moved out. I got myself a sublet for a month because I just needed to think things over. And I didn't really know it was going to happen. But what happened for me is, is my alcoholism perked up. And I started to think, oh, my God, maybe I, maybe that's true for me, too. And, um, you know, and it, it really scared me. It really rocked me. And um, what happened is one day I was on my way to this sister fellowship, and I realized this voice loud and clear said, you don't need to go to that meeting. You need to, you need to be at that AA meeting. Like, that's where, you, that's where you need to be. You're in trouble. You're the alcoholic. Who cares about him? Not who cares about him, but, like, you need to do something, Missy, because you are on fire. You know, you need the steps in your life pronto, you know, in, in an active, real way. And uh, so I went to my meeting, the Atlantic Group, and um, it was at the information break. They did, we do a big book, Thumper Stumper, and it was like, 
all that stuff, that's like what kind of group I got sober in. And I was like, oh, la la, you know, and, um, and I got Ava as my sponsor, um, you know, and I quickly got plugged in. I got into, into service and, um, and, you know, and I was able to go through the, Ava took me through the book and, you know, and I went to a couple different big book weekends and, you know, it was like my, my the way I sponsored totally changed, um, you know, and the way, you know, my this ex fiance has soon you know he's he's now married to somebody else and you know it's it's like we had a very amicable breakup it was very dignified my my sponsor walked me through it you know she she taught me how to hire movers and and how to really walk through it with respect to his past but also taking care of my own sobriety you know I learned that I don't have to listen I didn't have to listen to him saying you know this is I'm like I didn't listen to him describing how much fun he was having going out because it was a trigger for me. It just was. Um, and just, you know, what my life is like today, I'm married to a guy who's not in the program. And um, just actually to, to piggyback on that, he, I met him on a blind date, and my, one of my sponsees, um, her non-alcoholic husband had been friends with him. And she had about a year sober, and she had a little bee in her bonnet. She was like, I want you to have what I have. And I was like, leave me alone. I'm your sponsor. That's not the primary purpose. <laughs> and, you know, and she was like, I want to put you up on this blind date. And I said, you know what? This is not, you know, I'm your sponsor. This is not da-da-da. And, um, and then I went to my sponsor, and she said, you're being way too rigid. Like, you don't have to share about the date with her, you know, but what's the problem? Like, do you... Because I'm very rigid sometimes, and um, so I finally went back to her and I said, "Fine, I'll go on the date with him." And um, you know, and it and it worked out well, and he's my husband today, and it's like a miracle to me. It's been two and a half years. I'm married, you know, but it totally takes that idea of practicing the principles into to a new level, and um, and you know, I've learned to apply the traditions in our relationship. Like I I think of him as my home group. You know, he's my other home group. And, um, you know, and I have to, you know, like my personal recovery depends upon, you know, our unity. I mean, it's interesting. It's been really interesting mar- married to someone who's not in the program because um, he will sometimes say you're the most important thing to me. And, you know, and I know that my sobriety comes first. My sobriety comes first. And I've also gotten to learn how to be flexible with my AA program and how not to make it all about me. You know, I need to take care of myself and go to my meeting, you know, and my this and my that. You know, I've, I've, I've learned. And it's also helped me normalize some of, like, all that, those old ideas I had. Like, I'm so sick. I'm the sick, sick, sick alcoholic. And, you know, I've learned that some of the emotions that I have as an alcoholic are, like, very normal emotions. It's just you combine them with alcoholism, and it's, you know, they're just, like, in 3D, you know. Um, and just to wrap up, actually, you know, um, um, you know, every day I ask God to to keep me sober, and um, and you know, just try to try to do my best to be helpful. And um, you know, I am I am praying for my for my mother today. And um, what I also know is that she has AA where she is, and she has a sponsor, and it's been amazing for me to um, to know that you know, not to get confused about her story and my story. Um, and just to love her, and that's been a direct, as a direct result of the steps and of the ninth step. Um, I've really gotten to experience unconditional love with her, and um, have been able to show up for her in a, in ways that I never. I mean, she was one of the biggest, deepest resentments I had for years, 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 years. And um, and you know, like I wrote out the resentment time and time and time and time and time again. So I just share that, like, if anyone has a resentment that they they feel like, well, I've written this out already, I know what I'm going to find. I know what's in that fourth column. I know what my part is. Um, it really, for me, it didn't really matter. I just had to write it out again, and maybe, you know, and I discovered new things, and I went a little deeper every single time. Um, and then over time, like, it, it lifted, and I found myself able to act differently um, through gritted teeth, mind you, the, the first um, you know, for for a long time, and then it just it like lifted. And um, anyway, I'm just I'm so grateful to be sober, and um, and just grateful for you know that AA is here and that you're all here. And thanks for sharing sobriety with me tonight. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. 
So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.